which includes Char Blue Steakhouse and the Stack Pickle. For his service to the community, Gary was presented with the Arthur S. Arkush Humanitarian Award in 2009. It's an award bestowed on an NFL player whose contributions to the community and charitable organizations are especially outstanding. In 2016, Gary was named to the Indianapolis Business Journal's 2016 Class of 40 Under 40, and he's been featured in multiple publications across the U.S. And I just watched him last week on Big Ten Channel's campus seats from my living room on Xfinity One cable service. <laughs> Gary currently lives in Carmel, Indiana with his beautiful wife, Reagan, and their three wonderful children. Ladies and gentlemen, I present the Bloomington Chambers Retail Summit keynote speaker, Gary Brackett. Well, thank you, Scott, very much, and thanks to Comcast. Um, I use it at my house, and he is correct. It is super fast, as I have, um, Three kids who, who love uh, playing on the iPad all day, so uh, we get to test how, how efficient our Comcast is. Um, so I just wanted to say good morning to everyone. Um, thanks for being here. Um, just by a show of hands, how many people watched the game last night? There was a game on TV last night, the Super Bowl. How, how many show fans, how many people was not um, excited about the outcome? I just want to know if the hatred for the Patriots um, resides in Bloomington as much as it resides in Indianapolis. Um, I will tell you this, having played the Patriots um, over probably 11 times throughout my career, um, it's amazing how good for how long they have been. So despite my, my dislike, extreme dislike, close to hatred for the Patriots, <laughs> I respect them for being consistent, for being disciplined, and really for being good for that long. So, um, and I think that's why we're all here. I think we're here because we want to be effective, we want to be good, right? And we want to be champions. And it's amazing, every Super Bowl weekend, they have the Hall of Fame guys, and they get inducted. And during halftime, they induct every, every year the newest members uh, for 2019. And, and, and it shows my age now that I played with some of those guys. So I don't know if I'm old or they're old. Either, either one of those are true. Um, but I tell myself that I didn't have a Hall of Fame career. I had a very solid career, nine years, went to two Super Bowls. I hold a very cool record. I have the most solo tackles in any Super Bowl of any player. Um, so very proud about that. Uh, unfortunately, we lost that game. Um, but nonetheless, I still have a ring. But I tell myself, I don't think I should stop wanting to be a champion or a Hall of Fame. I think I can still be a Hall of Fame father. I still could be a Hall of Fame CEO. I still could be a Hall of Fame community activist. So it's amazing to me that those guys getting um, all those accolades, which they should get. But for me, now it's about continuing that Hall of Fame career even after I'm done playing football. So that's why I'm here today. And what capacity am I here? I know a lot of people think, all right, he's a football player. We're going to talk about football. We're going to review the game. Like Tony Romo, is he going to come in here and predict what's going to happen next year? All right? Um, but I just want to show you um, some other things um, of who I am. So um, obviously Super Bowl champion. Um, I'm a commercial real estate broker. I got my commercial real estate license about four years ago. Um, so I do a lot of our site selection for our stack pickle restaurants. Um, like Scott said, I'm CEO of Bracket Restaurant Group. We have nine stack pickles, which is a sports bar. We were named number one sports bar, number one neighborhood bar in Indianapolis, and also a steakhouse car, Char Blue. So that's my CEO. Um, that's my day to day. Um, I also have an MBA from George Washington University. Um, after I was finished with playing football, I felt like um, for all of us, we all have a toolbox that we use. And for nine years when I was playing in the NFL, um, the tool of my choice for me uh, was a hammer. And the problem is, when your hammer is your tool, every situation looks like a nail, right? So I think going back to school gave me the ability to really understand and calculate things a little bit differently, and I understand how to use some different tools in my toolbox, how to really sharpen the saw and some other things that would be useful as you continue in my business career. I'm also a certified franchise expert. 
Um, Stack Pickle is a sports chain. We have nine units. We now have four franchise locations, all which are going to be developed in 2019. Um, so that's also something I'm very passionate about, growing and expanding our brand. I want to uh, educate myself on the process of being uh, able to franchise. So I re recently got that degree. But the next degree I think is most important. Because um, as CEO, um, sometimes my kids for career they ask like, Dad, what do you do? Like, well, what I, I know you're you won a championship, you got a real estate broker, um, you went, you got an MBA, um, you're certified franchise. What, what, what does that mean? And I told what I really majored in was a GSD, right? And that's the that's how I get stuff done. I don't know if stuff ends with a with a T, right? But I think you guys can use your imagination. Um, and in order to get stuff done, you, you really have to be knowledgeable about the industry, knowledgeable about the changes, knowledgeable about te technology and how you can utilize that to the best of your ability to really have your company become almost like the Patriots, right? To be successful year in, year out. Uh, no longer are the days where you can thumb through and, and, and accidentally be successful. I think now, in order to be successful in 2019, you definitely have to be intentional about doing that. So I'm gonna share with you five ways as a CEO, things that we look at and we go over and we review from 2018 to 2019, looking at the retail, looking at the environment, and things that we're really considering and moving forward to kind of lead to that success. Um, so let's take an overview of where we're at in the retail space. Um, one is the longest boom market in the history. All right, so very exciting stuff. Um, it's been going on for a long time now, since 20, uh, 2008. Um, historical low unemployment. Um, so that's a good thing for the economy, not so good for employers, right? When you're looking for a workforce, you're looking for people that actually hire, um, there's not a lot of people that are available. Um, one thing I, I saw was a very interesting statistic, even with Amazon, 85% um, of retail sales are still happening at a physical location, right? So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. However, there are some negative trends, right? There's a generational shift in consumer demand. The, these millennials and, and centennials, right? We, we can't really figure them out, right? Are they coming out to eat anymore? Are they buying houses? Do they want to live in apartments, right? They're not having kids, right? So all, all these new challenges that we're gonna look into. Rising interest rates. Um, as interest rates continue to rise, obviously that put more pressure on business. Uh, global and political uncertainties. Obviously, uh, we know what's happened at the top with some of our political concerns um, and rising construction costs. If you're in a commercial real estate business, obviously the cost to build new construction has went up and in return for retailers that also increase your rental rates. Right? I look at rental rates now and I think uh, I was looking at uh, actually real estate in Bloomington a couple years ago and I found out a very interesting fact that I think Bloomington holds the record for the most expensive real estate in the state of Indiana. Is, is that correct? Is, do we have any real estate brokers in the room? Um, so $40 per foot, I was like, I, I'm almost working for you. Like, I mean, when do I sign in? Do I punch a clock? I mean, that's very expensive real estate when you're looking at a retail operation. So what do I look at when I'm looking at the market? Number one, I think we've all heard this. Raise your hand if you heard location, location, location. I think we all heard about how important it is to have a great location um, in retail, commercial brokership. But I think um, Phyllis said location is the key to most businesses and entrepreneurs typically build their reputation at a particular spot. So one thing that's interesting about locations is what I believe is that we no longer can just physically look at a location and put our thumb in the air and tell ourselves, you know what, this is gonna work out. I think now with all the data, with all the tools that we have, we, we now have signed a master broker called Local AI that's similar to SiteZeus or Brixton that anyone knows. When you use artificial intelligence to tell us where exactly our stores could be, we can almost for a 15% um, percent um, estimate what our sales will be at our given location based on credit card spend. So if you're in a retail operation and you're looking at expanding your operation, if you're looking at different locations, you got to be using technology and tools that are available to really identify where people are spending their money, where are those habits happening. Because the difference before you being successful and you not could be three or four blocks. So having that data available to you that's readily available, uh, you have to start utilizing that in order to make some wise decisions. Um, some of my locations, um, one of them are in Houston, another one is Orlando. We spend a lot of time 
um, with our franchisee. Uh, my franchisee in Orlando, after three months, he wanted to give up the search. And, and I had to uh, talk him off the ledge and tell him, like, look, man, real estate is something we're not going to jump at. Like, there's, there's one thing we can't do once we get started, and that's selecting the right location. So it's really about spending the right time, spending the right resources to identify the proper location to make sure that you're going to set yourself up for success from day one. Um, another thing um, that I look at, and I got taught this by Coach Dungey. So in 2007, uh, we lost a game um, in overtime versus the Carolina Panthers. And it was the first time ever we went to Kansas City and we lost back-to-back -back games. Right, so for my history with the Colts, we have never lost back-to-back -back games. Uh, instead of the 2011 season, which I'm gonna forget out of my memory because we won two games, um, but we got Andrew Luck, so it wasn't all that bad. But usually after a game, you come to the locker room on Mondays. 12 o'clock is the first meeting. So typically, at 11.59, 11.58, people are trickling into the meeting. This meeting, we lost two games, 11.30, the whole room was filled. Everyone is silent. Because typically in NFL, when you lose games, people lose their jobs. So when Coach Dungeon came up 12 o'clock, he started to meet and said, hey, if you guys were in New England, five people would get fired. If you were in Pittsburgh, four people would get fired. If you were in, in San Francisco, three people would have got fired today. But he said the same people who won eight games in a row has just lost two games in a row. So what we're gonna do is, instead of adding more, instead of doing more, we're gonna take away. We're gonna get so good at executing what we do best, and we're gonna execute better than our competition. And I think it's no different for you and your business. What do you do best, and what can you execute at a high level? So for us, when we look at our product mix, we look at products that move and products that don't move. And, and even taking that a step further, we look at products that move, and then use technology to see what products move that actually someone came back in seven weeks later or seven days later and purchased again versus what products that may be sold and, and they didn't come back in. I, I'm going to be honest. So we have two sides of our menu. How many people have ever been to a stack pickle before? Awesome. So you know how delicious our food is. I don't have to sit up here and brag. You know. Uh, so on our menu, we're a sports bar. So the first part of our menu is all of our big hitters. We have our stack burgers. We have our pork tenderloin sandwich. We have our wings. Who's getting hungry in the room? <laughs> So on the second part of our menu, we have our healthy options, right? So we have our salads, we have our wraps, we have our rice bowls, right? All are very needed when you look at our trends. But if you look at our wraps, I'm not gonna lie, like, our, our wrap, it's a wrap. I don't, I don't know how many people have had a wrap and it's like, this is delicious, right? <laughs> it's, it's a wrap. Someone is, is probably conscious about their weight, they probably wanna eat light, whatever reason it is, they're eating a wrap. Right, we didn't put any sauces on there. We kept the calorie count low. So someone, someone came to me and said, hey, man, I had your wrap, and it was just okay. I'm like, please explain to me where you had a wrap when it wasn't just okay. <laughs> like, I, I want to I go to that place. So I think understanding what moves the menu and whatnot. So, so what we do with that information then, so if we have a loss leader situation where I'm bringing someone inside of my restaurant, I'm not going to say, hey, come to the stack pickle and give you a free wrap, right? I know that's not one of our heavy hitters, right? Then on the menu, right, just to check the box, right? I want you to come have a burger. Our burgers are delicious, all right? Our jumbo wings are fantastic. But if you come and eat it right, right, you could have went you could you could have ate salad at the grocery store. So, so for me, having that information and knowing what I can do and what I can't do, I think is important in terms of addition by subtraction. I think when you talk about even the macro level, you look at some of the stores and some of the other trends, Lowe's and Gap, their addition by subtraction is seeing some of their stores that are underperforming and they're shutting down units, they're shutting down units so they can protect their top line profitability, right? And I think that's a, a, a more important distinction. And every year what we do is we look at our bottom performers and we have to make a decision. Is this something that we can make viable or is this a situation where we got to cut bait? And none of these are easy decisions, but I think they need to be made in order for you to be successful. I think it's so challenging if anyone has multiple locations or multiple businesses, and one business is not holding its own weight. It, you, you, you waste so much of your precious time on trying to figure out how to make that business profitable versus figuring out your bread and butter, how to make that more successful.
So sometimes addition by subtraction is the route that you need to take. The third thing that I look at is strategic partnerships. How can you now, in your retail sector, create strategic partnerships to help you become successful? I saw a study on Best Buy, and for years and years, Best Buy was losing ground to Amazon. Right? What do consumers do? They go on to Best Buy, they see a TV, they go home, they go on Amazon, and then they purchase it. All right? So first thing Best Buy did, that was genius, they, they price match. If you come in and you have any other vendor, um, we'll match their price. Right? So no longer you have to wait three or four days, but now with Amazon Prime, you will probably get a TV in a couple hours, or a blue truck running out. But they, they, they got competitive. The second thing they did was they went up to their manufacturers, LG, and so on and said, what, what would happen to your business if we went away? Would you guys struggle if you no longer had a physical footprint to sell your product out of? And then Sony and LG started investing and had the storefronts inside of Best Buy, right? So strategic partnerships to help out both units. One, if they didn't do that, if Best Buy lost their business, then guess what, LG? You're at Amazon, and guess what your price is gonna keep on doing? It's gonna keep on decreasing, right? Supply and demand. So they made strategic investment inside of Best Buy. So what, what strategic investments can you make inside of your business that's gonna help you survive in 2019? For us at the Stack Pickle, our strategic investment was DoorDash, it was Grubhub, it was Uber Eats. Three years ago, we tried all three of them, and we realized that we were getting gouged, right? They take 30% of sales when we use any of these services. In addition to that, the oper it was an operational nightmare. They had iPads that sometimes work, sometimes doesn't work, sometimes the driver comes, sometimes the driver doesn't come. It all reflects bad, bad upon us. So what we did is we went out and we scoured all the technology that was available, and we found a technology that's able to speak directly into our POS system, so it takes the bartender out of the equation. It's no longer that bartender with 10 people at our bar rail has our back turned, punching in orders from, from Uber Eats. Now she can concentrate and do our job to take care of our guests, and now we have technology that speaks to our back of the house that can produce that food, right? Strategic partnerships. Walmart is another great example. I think you go to Walmart, you can cash a check, you can get your hair done, get your nails done, right? You get your gas, uh, you can get your car fixed, right? So they made a one-stop shopping, right? Strategic partnerships in order to survive. Another thing, um, experience is king. I think training is tied to culture. How many, how many people have ever been to McDonald's before? Right? Probably everyone in the room. How many people have been to Chick-fil-A? Do you notice anything different about Chick-fil-A and McDonald's? What's the one thing that you know that's different? Customer service. Customer service. All right? And do you think it's intentional with the Chick-fil-A that their customer service is better than McDonald's? Absolutely. They spend a lot of time on training their, 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 their people at their drive through it, It's amazing how polite they are, right? Everything is my pleasure. And it, you go to McDonald's, how, how many people have ever got my pleasure from McDonald's? <laughs> right? How, how many people ever got the correct order from McDonald's <laughs> when you order in, in drive through Right? It's, it's amazing those two companies, those two different distinctions, there's no wonder that McDonald's is now struggling with their franchisees and Chick-fil-A is flourishing. Right? It comes back to training. Two years ago, I recognized that when we lost our system managers, our, our managers would just go to our most senior um, server and say, hey, you want to be a manager? Jump on board. You're closing next week. Right? And what we realized was that Without giving our system managers the proper training, one, they weren't doing a good enough job, and two, we weren't retaining them. They didn't feel comfortable in their, in, in, in their position. So I told my CFO, I said, you know what, we have to do a better job of training. Our 2017 initiative was to train our managers better. Everyone gets forward with training, no matter what. If we need to shift labor around, if we need to pay overtime, whatever we need to do, we need to train our people better. And our CFO, typical CFO response was like, that's gonna cost a lot of money. What if we train our people and they leave, right? But my, my question was, as a CEO, what if we don't train them and they stay? 
right? So I think it's that experience treating, um, that training philosophy that's going to continue to have you be successful. And the last thing um, before we get into um, so, some Q&A, so definitely get your questions um, ready. Um, I like to call it a winning game plan. People ask me, why did you get into the restaurant business? And my, my first answer is I probably got hit in the head too much as, <laughs> as an NFL player. Um, but, but my second answer is that restaurants are the ultimate team sport. If you ever worked into the restaurant, you know that everyone has to be working together in order for you to have an effective shift. The hostess has to be friendly. She has to read the table to make that first impression. She delivers to the server, who then has to communicate what do you want to drink, right? The server puts an order, then has to go to the back of the house. They have to make the food correctly. The manager has to manage it all. They come check on you, make sure that everything is being okay. Right? So everything has to work together in order for you to win. So that was really um, made me really passionate about the restaurant industry. So when I look at the restaurant industry, and I look at how we're going to be successful, I took a playbook out of what we did, or how we were successful with the Indianapolis Colts. Right? So I developed the game plan. And our game plan is around our people, our product, our promotions, our procedures, our place, and lastly, profit. And the reason for me that profit is last is that in the restaurant industry, if profit was first, I wouldn't have good people, right? If profit was first, our promotions would not bring people inside of the door, right? If profit was first, our procedures would not get followed because if we cared just about top line or bottom line, right, none of our employees would stay with us because they realize what's going on. So some of the, the, the most amazing things that I realized as a CEO um, is that the common sense principle does not exist sometimes in business. Right? What's common sense is not always common practice. I'm gonna give you a for example. We had, a, we had a, a, a manager that was on duty and he also worked shifts as a bartender. So we got hit with excise, excise came in, everyone knows what excise is, right? It's like the, it's like the liquor police that come in and it's like, I don't know if this is like borderline entrapment or what, but every, every time it's the same old, it's a guy and a girl, guy goes to the bar, girl leaves, goes to the bathroom, let me order two drinks. If you forget the car, the girl, then you're in violation, All right? Pretty simple. We, we train our managers, we teach them this, but what happens? There's 25 people at the bar, the bartender makes his rounds, the guy orders drinks after 10 minutes, he forgets he didn't call the girl, bam, we get hit with a violation, right? Any big corporation, Applebee's, Buffalo Wild Wings, one infraction by a server, and guess what, you're terminated. No questions asked. So our manager calls us, he called me in tears, and he said, hey man, I gotta tell you this because you always want bad news first, we just got hit with a violation, all right? So I'm like, all right, what happened? Give me some context. He gave me a scenario, it was Antonio, he's my best guy, um, man, I, I hate to lose him. And my question to him was like, well, why do we have to lose him? He was like, he was like well, everywhere I worked, if someone had an infection, then, then we would get rid of him immediately. I'm like, all right, so if someone from Buffalo Wild Wings was a great server and was awesome and they made one bad decision, would you hire that person at the Stack Pickle? Like, absolutely, it, it, it didn't work for us when that happened. So I'm like, so, so why this individual you're gonna let leave because he made a bad decision? I said, let's communicate his decision. Let's, let's demote him from being a manager to just being a bartender or being a server. Let's, let, let's have him earn our trust to get back into the position that he was, but let's tie with this employee. And, and the reason I learned that is because when you have an excise violation, you go in front of the excise court. And on the excise court, they ask you specifically what happened to the employee that had this violation. And everyone, nine, nine out of 10 people, oh, we got rid of that employee. No, no, no longer have to deal with them. And then the excise guy always says, that's the dumbest thing you ever did. They, they would never make that mistake again, right? And, and it made me realize, like, why are we terminating a viable employee, right? My belief is that sometimes your best ability is your availability. If this guy is available, if he works hard, he made one bad decision, we're gonna terminate this guy? So by salvaging him, 
Not only did he respect us, but I hold that type of leadership and leading with that type of culture, I think you win over time. Because in business, my philosophy is you have to play for the long term. You have to play for the next five, 10, 15, 20 years. If you're playing for the next six months, the next year, are you gonna lose out on some opportunities where you would other have wise would have took advantage of? So you have to have this game plan on why you're gonna be successful. So questions to ponder. As, as we face all these challenges and all these opportunities in 2019, are you giving your team the right tools for success? And are you going to evolve your business to fit into the current market? You, you hear all the time that, that retail is dying. And I don't think it's dying as much as it's changing. And if you're not willing or able to change with the times, then of course you're gonna die. And it's amazing to me, and I have to coach some of my more senior managers, of when we, when we challenge a process, we challenge a procedure, we, we challenge something, what, what's the, one of the, the most common answers you get? Well, well we, we always did it that way. You, you know who said we always did it that way? Blockbuster. Right? We, we, we've always charged $350 if you don't bring our movie back in a week. We just, we just always done that, right? How, how did that work out for Blockbuster? Not too well. So I think your willingness to change, your willingness to evolve, your willingness to, to recognize the market and utilize technology. Everyone in this room has the ability to learn. So whether it's Facebook ads, whether it's CEO, Whereas any of this new technology, you can learn it. But first, you have to break that own barrier in your own mind, convincing yourself that it can't be done. Because if you're not willing to learn, I'm guaranteeing you there's someone else out there that will, like Netflix, like Amazon, right? That's willing to dominate the market. So kudos to you for being here. I think this is a huge opportunity for you to learn, for you to grow, for you to utilize some tools that you can go back and be helpful to your business. So today, one of my things when I go to any type of convention, uh, we just came back from Fort Lauderdale um, to a convention, find three takeaways from today. Three takeaways that you can write down, put on your phone, write on your mirror when you go home, that you can actually put into practice. Don't, don't, don't just be here and network and have some cards and I want to hand out some business cards and come home and don't write any information down. You're gonna have powerful information that you're gonna to learn today. So find three things that you could take away from today that's gonna to lead you to have your best year in 2019. Thank you very much for your time. So now I think we have about 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, so you guys can ask about almost about anything. I'm an open book. Um, so who has the first question? Yes. Um, what do you do to drive traffic into your facility? That's a great question. What do we do to drive traffic inside our facility? Um, I think it's a multi-pronged approach. One, we have to take care of them when they get inside of our four walls. I think one of our, 80% um, of our business comes from the people who are already inside of our four walls. So how do we do that? We have um, a company called Vibtronics where there's music playing and then there's reminders in between the music that tells them, hey, Friday night, join us, we have a band playing. Six o'clock this band, join us this half pickle Friday night. Right, we have posters inside of our wall so they, they physically get to see what we're saying. Um, so those are things that we utilize. And from the other driving new customers um, is, is digital. My, my opinion is that um, digital scale is far greater than traditional media. So we spend a bunch of resources on Facebook ads, on Google AdWords, on SEO, on Google My Business pages, all these things to get in front of our consumer. I'm, I'm sure everyone has a, 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 their phone, right? And when I phoned like a couple months ago, they had this, they had this timer where they showed you how much time where we you're on your phone, on your devices, right? I was disgusted by it, I turned it off. I said, I don't wanna see it, right? It's market research. But I, think, but I think it's consistent with everyone else. When everyone is on their phone 
three, four, five hours out of the day. So you have to speak to them where they are. And I think they have their eyeballs on their phone. So you have to get to them on the platforms that they're on. Uh, there's always a mistake made in a business. What tools do you give your employees to remedy a situation so a customer client comes back and repeats coming back despite having what potentially was a bad experience? Right. Um, I wish I could stay here and say that we, we are 100% in terms of our customer satisfaction. Um, we are not. Um, we, we train on legendary service. Um, in football, you don't remember um, average players. You remember, you remember the legends. Um, so for us, I think it's important that we go above and beyond um, when, we, when we don't perform inside our restaurants. So if our customer has a bad experience, as a manager, you should realize that it's occurring because you should be on the floor touching every table. And when that, more times than not, if we handle a situation when it occurs inside of the restaurants, we have a better chance of recovering that guest for having them leave our, our, our four walls, get on Facebook or Yelp or any other four letter word that they can, right, and terrorist one. So for us, it's about acknowledging um, inside our four walls what we can do to give back. Can we recook it? Can we give you a gift card? Please come back and give us a try. Um, from a digital perspective, when we uh, get it wrong and we don't acknowledge inside of our four walls, we send them out a, a coupon that says, oops, we goofed. Right? And it's a 10 hour coupon. So when they present it, um, when they come in, it says, hey, when you come in, show this to your, um, so your hostess desk so they know. So that way, that gets communicated with our managers. And then we can say, hey, we messed up last time. You know, we're, we're going to perform at any time. This is the time. So I think making those acknowledgments um, is very important. Lastly, um, going back to the digital platform, we just signed up for another platform so that we can aggregate all of our. Um, reviews on one site. So one dashboard that you can go in and see your Yelp, your Google Plus, your Facebook, all that stuff on one site so you can answer those reviews. Um, I was in San Padre Island in Houston with my family for spring break. And I, I went on uh, TripAdvisor and I said, hey, my family want to come in, we're going to eat wings. So I looked at this one place that had like 2.2 reviews and someone told me to go there and I look and I see the reviews and no one responded. And I'm like, how crazy is that that no one responded? And it's just like, if someone inside of your business went to you and said they had a bad time, would you, would you not respond? So for the consumer in the outside world, when they look on your website, when they look at your reviews, and they see no one responding, what do they think? No one is home. Nobody cares. So I think responding, and a lot of times, I get with my managers like, hey, did you respond to this guy? Oh, yeah, I DM'd him. It was private. Like, no, we need a public. I need. I, I don't want him to see. I want everyone else to see that he had an issue and we addressed his issue. So we're, we're constantly preaching that, trying to get better at that. But I think it's very important um, when consumers are choosing where they want to go, they want to go to places that care. Yes. The, uh, the, the stat, the 85% still, 85% uh, of consumers still like to go into a physical <laughs> store. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you suppose that is, and how do you manage your customers' experience? Yeah, the so I think customers are going to stores for experiences, right? So if you have um, a Sprint iPhone, if you go to Apple, Apple has done a fantastic job um, of educating their consumer once you go inside their four walls. They either upgrade you or, or, or talk to you about what exactly product that you need. Because you can say, hey, I have all, all the money in the world. I want to buy this expensive computer. And you go to Apple, and most times they say, oh, you don't need that. Like, you, you're not going to do graphics. You're not building video games. This computer will suffice. So I think that, and I think another thing is that baby boomers are still a, a large um, population base. And I think they're spending habits to influence that number. Right? I think as the millennials and as the centennials continue to earn <coughs> money and continue to spend, I think that number is going to drastically change because they don't care. They want to go on Amazon Prime and order something. Right? Um, even my wife now, we order our groceries online. So I think the number is changing. So I think you just have to be aware of where it's at and where that number is trending to. Yes. First of all, you've done an awesome job of reinventing yourself. And I've watched every game you played in. Good job. I appreciate awesome. that. But in the thing that we're reinventing, 
with a business like yours, do you, do you think about reinventing your product and, and your service to keep that uh, alive and active and interesting to the public and to your customers? I think we have to. I think anytime when we look at our current trends, I think one thing, and um, my, my good friend and colleague who's taping in the front row, he's a vegetarian. And maybe for the last year and a half, he was talking to us about bringing an Impossible Burger in on our menu, right? And all of our managers in our front row, no one's gonna buy it, it's not gonna happen, but you see every trend, every big chain is bringing in the Impossible Burger. So I think um, as we continue to look at um, technology, um, best practices, we have to continue to evolve and grow and change. So I think um, another thing we've done that was, wasn't was more for the consumer, but more operationally efficiency is um, we changed our POS system, right? So our point of sale system was micros. I don't know if anyone ever dealt with micros before, but when, um, who was it, uh, Cisco brought them, um, their customer servers went to being good to, to not very good, right? Um, so what we did, uh, we switched uh, over to Toast, and Toast has a cloud-based system. All right, so all of our POS is the same. And Toast is so dynamic that if we have a price change on our menu, we could do it from our corporate office and say, hey, um, our new menu is rolling out, this is our new menu prices, and we could press one button and get it done at all nine of our locations. During the old way, we had to go to every physical location, look on their micro POS, and change every individual order. So I think utilizing technology and being really ahead of the curve is gonna help us continue to, to to, to be in front of the trends and, and help them drive business out of our restaurants. Yes? How painful was that process of doing franchising? Uh, very painful. Um, so uh, so fr franchising is um, very interesting. They, so I, I've now been to about 10 different conferences, IFA, Franchise Development in Atlanta, so that's where I really got my CFE. But I think it's like anything else where People want to intimidate you about the process, so you'll spend more money for them to do it for you. So um, I went through three different iterations of my FDD. Um, it's called a franchise disclosure document. Um, it probably cost me $250,000, right, all in. And um, what I realized that in the beginning, when I was trying to avoid paying, I ended up paying triple the price. So I think if, if franchising is a part of your DNA as a company, I think going in with your eyes wide open and realizing how expensive it's gonna be. And now I run my franchise business as if it's a bona fide business. All right, what's the income? What are the expenses? All right, what are, what are the P&L showing? And again, it's a startup business, so I'm gonna treat it a little bit different, but at the same time, I have an expectation on what return I have, and I know I have to invest in that business. So it was very painful, but now after I've done it again, like the revenue stream that you can make as a franchise are is incredible. And going to conferences in Vegas and seeing like the airport was a whole bunch of private jets and half of those being franchisors made me realize like there's something here, All right? So I think there's a lot to someone creating a system, building a model, and then giving you access to that model and making it turnkey. Um, Cause so many times, small businesses, um, they fail because they don't have the right structure in place. And buying a franchise gives you that right structure from day one. So you don't have to learn from your own mistakes. You can learn from my mistakes, right? And I'm just gonna charge you 5%. Um, whereas though, if you learn from your own mistakes, it might cost you everything. So I think franchising is very difficult, but done properly uh, is very lucrative. Do I use retail? Like t-shirts. Oh, t-shirts. So um, we're gonna try it again this year. So um, so we we've, we've used retail before inside of our stores, and the challenge was we really didn't have good inventory systems on that retail. So 100 shirts with the 70 shirts with the 50 shirts, and then when we looked at our POS, we didn't sell. We don't have the money for 50 shirts. So what happened to them? So I think. Um, Retail is sometimes challenging when you don't have the right manager to kind of inventory it. I think what we're gonna to do to now, we're gonna have very little retail inside of our stores, and then we're gonna do like a drop shipping platform from our website where you can go in and build your shirt and then we can have it every size. Another challenge that we experienced inside of our four walls, retail wasn't really our business model. Like we had to carry every size. 
And for guys, it's like, all right, large, extra large, I wear it. For women, if it's not my size, I'm not wearing it. Right? If it's too small, too big. So I think now, giving us access to uh, set up those resources on our website, where someone could order online, they can get exactly the size that they want, and they can come in, we don't have to carry the inventory, and we get a lower fee, but, but that's definitely a model that we're looking at in 2019 to explain our brand. All right, last question, I think. Where's the, where's the end at? Are we good on time? You're okay. You're I'm good? All right, great. I'm going to do this all day. Like, this is <laughs> I was in the restaurant industry for 30 years, and I understand I was with Domino's Pizza, so I understand the delivery of food. Mm -hmm. How do you maintain quality of your food when you hand it off to uh, an Uber Eats or whoever's delivering for you? So I, I will tell you this: um, in some of our restaurants, like say for instance West Lafayette, we had to cancel our subscriptions with some of those vendors because they weren't handling our food properly. So I think for us, it's just just about auditing who's taking out our food and looking at our reviews and seeing what kind of performance and what kind of reviews are we getting out there. Most of the brands now are big enough, like the top three brands, they're big enough where they're doing a good enough job where they have the business model guy. We still get calls that, hey, it seemed like y'all shorted me on fries and, and my delivery driver's mouth was greasy when he came to my door. <laughs> um, but um, that's, uh, we can't really control that. I mean, you know, you have to account for some type of uh, error inside of your business. Um, but um, it's amazing, in one of my stores, uh, online third-party delivery accounts for 25% of revenue. 25%, so that's a significant piece. So what that does in the future is we look at our locations and how we're gonna build them differently. Or how we're gonna access the kitchen. Where's the takeout and delivery gonna be? Is it big enough? Can we account for all this uh, third, third party delivery? So it really just shows you how big the market is. And, and, and the craziest thing about third party delivery, we have some stores and mixed use centers. Like someone would literally be on the third floor of our building and order third party delivery. <laughs> and then this is like, are you kidding me? Right? So uh, I think what we did for the first quarter of this year was if you order online delivery and come to the store and pick it up, you know, a uh, very novice notion that someone actually would go pick up their food at a restaurant. Um, but I think we're giving out 25% in the first quarter just to kind of train our customers and our consumers on actually using our online app, ordering your food and come and pick it up. So that's where I'm, I'm hoping like an ideal world where people start revolting against third party and start actually driving the restaurant and pick it up, I don't think that's gonna happen. So I think we have to acknowledge it, we have to play ball and just do the best that we can. Well, thank you all very much. I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. That was just amazing. Thank you so much, Gary, for that insight uh, that you shared with us and the great discussion that followed. Uh, we really do appreciate you being here. Uh, we're going to take a quick break uh, while we get our first panel of the day situated on the stage. So breakfast, some, some food is still available for you out there. I'm going to have some coffee and other snacks. So feel free to go and uh, get refueled and then come have a seat. We'll start back again at 945. Thanks, guys.